uh, on behalf of New York Law School and Dean Anthony Crowell to the 180th City Law Breakfast, which we began in 1994. Thank you for attending and for helping to make City Law Breakfast an important public forum. Uh, first thing I want to do is thank our generous and loyal founding sponsors of the City Law Breakfast series. They are, as many of you know, Consolidated Edison, Verizon, and the law firm of Greenberg Traurig. I also want to thank each of you for attending the breakfast and for making a voluntary contribution when you signed up to attend the breakfast. The names of all the voluntary contributors will be prominently listed in the email sent to every breakfast, uh, sent after every breakfast with the link to the video. We are enormously grateful for the founding sponsors and for the voluntary contributions that help make these city law breakfasts possible. After uh, Jacques Zihar's prepared remarks, we will have a question and comment session. Uh, you may submit a question or a comment at any time during the breakfast. Uh, we will collect the questions and comments as they come in. To submit a question or comment, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. And we do ask that you identify yourself with both your first and last name and if relevant, your organization. Uh, following the questions and comments, uh, Anthony Crowell, Dean of New York Law School, will join us uh, for a colloquy uh, with uh, Director Jiha. We are delighted to welcome OMB Director Jacques Jiha to our City Law Breakfast Series. Jacques Jiha was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti in 1958. In December 1979, at age 21, Jiha immigrated to the United States to further his education. He worked his way through Fordham University at various jobs, including famously as a parking lot attendant. He earned his bachelor's degree in economics in 1985 and his doctorate from the New School in 1990. Jiha in his career has had a vast and extensive experience in government and the private sector. Uh, in government, uh, he held increasingly important and responsible positions with the New York State Assembly, the New York State Controller's Office, the Nassau County Controller's Office, and the New York City Controller's Office. Following this extensive experience in government, Jiha switched to the private sector where he was the Chief Operating Officer at the Earl G. Graves Limited. In 2014, Mayor Bill de Blasio brought Jiha back into government as Commissioner of Finance and later as Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Mayor Eric Adams, indicating the respect which Jiha has earned, kept Jiha as his OMB Director. Uh, I did a little looking to see if uh, more about, we could learn about the experiences of uh, Director Jiha, and I found in a brief bio he wrote, for the common good, uh, movingly about his life. G.R. wrote, and I quote, that just three decades ago, immigrants like me were often referred to as boat people, a pejorative description of those who were escaping the Devalier dictatorship in Haiti. No other group of refugees entering the United States had ever been referred to as such. Until 1980, Haitians who had risked their lives to sail to the United States were not even permitted to apply for asylum. While my story is the archetypal American Horatio Alger story of imagining your goals, working hard and achieving the dream, it is also the story of a city that welcomed immigrants from places like Alabama, Ohio, Ukraine, France, and Jamaica and provides them with the opportunities to succeed as they in the process contribute to Americans' expansion and diversity and the forging of a more perfect union. New York Law School is honored to welcome OMB Director Jacques Jihad to the City Law Breakfast Forum. Director Jihad, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Sandra, for inviting me to speak uh, this morning. Uh, some of uh, the uh, members of this audience may not know, but uh, you serve uh, the city with uh, distinction in various capacities, including as a senior advisor to different mayors. 
I appreciate your contributions to public service and thank you for your many accomplishments which have uh, improved the, the lives of uh, countless New Yorkers. Just uh, two years ago, uh, the city along with the nation and the world was uh, plunged into an unprecedented catastrophe. This morning, I will discuss the state of the city's economy, uh, its impact on this administration, decision-making, and uh, the uh, bold steps Mayor Adams has taken to craft uh, a fiscally responsible budget to accelerate the city's economic recovery to elevate vulnerable New Yorkers and working families and to protect our future. When uh, Mayor Adams took office back in January, the national economy was uh, very strong at the time, but the local economic recovery was very uneven. On the one hand, uh, Wall Street experienced record profits and bonuses in 2020 and 2021. This activity along with federal stimulus resulted in strong personal income, income growth uh, and also in very strong personal income taxes. Further, residential um, uh, real estate sales in New York City were rebounding. Um, these were very positive uh, for uh, the city. However, other indicators painted a less rosy picture of uh, the city's economy. New York City lagged both the country and the state in post-pandemic job gains. Though this number was later revised by the U.S. Department of Labor, back in uh, January, the employment data indicated that we had recovered just 55% of uh, the loss uh, the loss of jobs compared with the state 63% and the nation 85%. Our unemployment rate was uh, nearly 9% compared with uh, to 4% nationally. Further, the Omicron uh, resurgence slowed both the pace of employees returning to their workplaces, and as a result, the local economy in particular, the tourism industry suffered. Before Omicron, the number of employees returning to office had been slow, but very, very gradual. It reaches a high of about 37% at the beginning of December of 2021. But because of the resurgence, by the end uh, of uh, that year, the percentage of, city of uh, office employees returning to the office dropped to 11%, a level that was substantially behind other major cities. Uh, when employees don't uh, return uh, to work, they don't come to work, they don't eat lunch at a nearby restaurant, they don't shop, at a close by uh, store, or they don't take their clothes to the Dracula. So our business districts in Manhattan suffer without foot traffic, and that slowed the economy. In particular, the commercial real estate market suffered. The office vacancy rate in Manhattan was nearly 20%. This is a record high. This is equivalent to every single office building in downtown Manhattan sitting empty. It is hard to imagine our core business district without employees and businesses, but he accurately portrays the challenge we are facing. Omicron also slowed recovery in a city's tourism sector, with the hotel occupancy dropping to about 40% in January. On top of uh, these concerns, Within a few weeks of taking office, we had to close nearly $3 billion budget gap. It is against this economic backdrop that we had to design the Adams administration first preliminary budget. 
a slowing economy, economic uncertainty, budget deadlines, and the reality that too many New Yorkers were falling behind. Though Condition shifted throughout the budget cycle, some for the better and some for the worse, including high inflation and the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. These concerns inform our budget strategy. Our objective was to stay focused on the basics and maintain fiscal discipline. This means remaining cautious in the face of uncertainty achieving efficiency, planning for the future, and using taxpayers' dollars wisely. Additionally, the mayor made a number of commitments during the campaign to keep the city street, streets safe and clean. As he has often said, public safety is a prerequisite to prosperity and recovery. By staying true, true to these principles, the administration has crafted a fiscally responsible budget and financial plan that not only advances our recovery, but protects the city from future uncertainty and elevates working families and vulnerable New Yorkers. This cautious approach was recently validated by, by Fitch ratings in upgrading New York City's bond outlook from stable to positive for the first time in more than a decade. The mayor has made clear that our agencies must make the best use of taxpayers' resources. 11 days into his new administration, the mayor implemented a program to eliminate the gap, which is otherwise known as paid. With uh, some exceptions, city agencies had to cut the city funded budgets by 3% in fiscal year 2023 and the out years of the financial plan. They were also encouraged to take down vacant positions, but could not cut services or lay off employees. The PEG was a success, achieving nearly $2 billion in savings across fiscal year 22 and 23, and was crucial toward balancing the budget. Further, Agencies generated a total of over $3 billion in gap savings in the out years of the financial plan. We remain focused on savings throughout the budget cycle, ultimately achieving more than $2.7 billion over fiscal years 22 and 23, and $4 billion in financial plan out years. This includes reflecting nearly $300 million in the adapt adapted budget. This is notable as previous administrations rarely add more than a de minimis amount of savings at adoption. Cautious fiscal management includes planning for the future. Building and maintaining budget reserves helps uh, uh, the city weather future storms and make long-term economic recovery more sustainable. In his first preliminary budget, um, that was released in February, Mayor Adams increased reserves uh, to a record level of $6.1 billion. We added funds throughout the fiscal year, ultimately working with the city council to add $2 billion at budget adoption. Reserves are now $8.3 billion, by far the highest level in city's history. This includes $1.9 billion in the rainy day fund, which has nearly doubled under this new administration. Separately, <clears throat> we replenish the city's labor reserves by uh, nearly $4.7 billion in anticipation of a labor deal in the upcoming months. We use a number of tools to keep spending under control, including conservative revenue forecasts and reviewing and approving spending initiatives from a value perspective. First, by law, the mayor's office sets the city's revenue. 
our tax revenue forecasts tend to be conservatives, conservative, which keeps a lead on the size of the budget and keeps spending under control. Second, spending initiatives are viewed through the prism of a value proposition. We ask the same question for each and every proposed initiative. Does the spending make New York City better, cleaner, safer, more equitable, or more livable? Does he add value? Third, can a worthy initiative be accomplished using existing resources by finding efficiency within an agency? And finally, to, magic, to manage headcount, we maintain a tool for one attrition hiring policy. That is, agencies can replace one employee after they lose two. This policy brought the city headcount down to about 304,000 from a high of 327,000 employees without laying off a single employee. Now, I would like uh, to highlight some of the administration investments, which have focused on public safety, educational opportunity, making New York City a clean and livable city, and elevating working families. We were able to fund these critical priorities through a rigorous commitment to achieving savings, coupled with increased tax revenue in the executive and adapted budget. As you know, the mayor is committed to reducing gun violence and improving safety on our streets and in the subway. So on top of more efficiently deploying NYPD officers to violence prone areas using existing resources, we added funding for the mayor's blueprint to end gun violence and multi-agency subway safety plan. This includes uh, funds to expand <clears throat> the uh, Behavioral Health Emergency Assistance Response Division, or Be Heard initiative, which sends social workers and EMTs instead of police officers to nonviolent 911 mental health calls. The administration also invested in creating, in creating educational opportunities and career pathways uh, for our youths by adding 10,000 slots to summarizing a total of 210,000 K-12 students can now participate in enriching summer programming. 30,000 slots were also added to the summer youth employment program expanding the program to 100,000 city funded slots. For the first time, this program is funded annually. The mayor has also been clear that public spaces must be clean and more livable. To that end, he added funding for litter basket service, precision cleaning, twice a week alternate site parking, and made an unprecedented level of investment in the street plan program. Funding was also added to help upgrade and maintain our world-class parks and increase resources for enhanced cleaning of streets and bike lanes. Mayor Adams has also prioritized helping New Yorkers who were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. This budget puts uh, money in low to middle income families' pockets by expanding the New York City Earned Income Tax Credit, the first increase in over 20 years, and by implementing a property tax rebate that will benefit 600,000 residents. The mayor has also incentivized expansion of child care options across the city. This year, <clears throat> we have implemented tax credit that will encourage the development of child care facilities uh, by property, uh, property owners and employers. And to help vulnerable New Yorkers get to work, uh, uh, to get to work to the doctor's office and to school or just across town, Fairfares, which 
helps low-income New Yorkers afford Metro cards is now funded annually. We also increase resources for mothers and young family with new family home visit programs, which supports regular healthcare visits for first-time mothers in the 33 neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID. The mayor also made the city's investment in maternal, medical, home, and obstetric simulation training, which will reduce maternal death and childbirth complications annually. Finally, the mayor invested $5 billion in capital fund to support subsidies for NYCHA and our Department of Housing Preservation and Development, bringing the city's investment in affordable housing to a record $22 billion. Before I conclude, I would like to briefly discuss major headwinds that will impact our decision-making going forward. As I said, the city's recovery has accelerated. We have recovered nearly 100,000 jobs since the beginning of the year, a growth rate that outpaces both the nation and the state. We are now at 77% of pre-pandemic job levels and anticipate a full recovery by the end of 2024, which is six months earlier than previously expected. Tourism is rebounding strongly, with hotel room demand nearing 96% of pre-pandemic levels. Last week, New York City had the highest occupancy of the top 25 markets, and average daily rates are now higher than pre-pandemic levels. However, there are very good reasons to remain cautious. Financial markets have been unstable, likely because of Federal Reserve actions and concerns about a possible economic slowdown. Stock market underperformance also has a major impact on the city's pension costs. As of yesterday, the pension funds are well below the expected positive return rate of 7%. This is significant because each point below the expected return rate increase our pension contribution substantially throughout the financial plan. The impact will not be limited to, only to the expense side only. The city relies heavily on capital gains from Wall Street to boost personal income and sales tax. As capital loss mount, the city's revenue will suffer. While the Federal Reserve is trying to uh, uh, engineer soft lending of the economy, <clears throat> we may end up with a hard lending. Downturns pose a significant risk to these tax revenues that make up nearly 70% of our expenses. Another concern has been private employees' slow return to office and its implication for the commercial real estate market. Lately, we have been headed in the right direction. Since January, the percentage of employees that have returned to their office was by more than 20 percentage points to over 42% as of last mid-June. Last mid However, according to the Partnership for New York City, 78% of employers currently use or plan to introduce a hybrid work policy, and only 10% will require daily attendance. We also remain cautious because the office vacancy rate still hovers around a record high of 20% and is not expected to peak until the year 2023. The drop in office demand created by hybrid office and remote work arrangements remains a significant risk and source of uncertainty. As I mentioned earlier, Labor contracts with nearly all of the city's represented workforce have expired. The reality is that the nearly $4.7 billion we added to the labor reserve over the financial plan is just a down payment. It represents only 1.25% 1 <clears throat> of wage increases. Our goal is to negotiate a deal with uh, with, labor, with our partners in the labor unions with significant labor savings to pay for the deal. So 
While we want to be fair to city employees, we must also protect the city's coffers and will not make a deal that the city cannot afford. We are also mindful of the impact of inflation on the budget. We have already reflected increased energy costs into the financial plan and expect price hikes for everything we purchase. On the capital side, costs of materials were already high because of the supply chain shortages, though we expect inflation to further exacerbate, exacerbate the impact. New York City's economy is also influenced influence by a threat uh, from across the globe. The Russian invasion of Ukraine continue to impact supply chains, food costs, and energy pricing worldwide. As always, we are monitoring these threats carefully and will take prudent steps to mitigate the impact on the city's budget, including building and maintaining the record level of reserves that serve as a hedge against economic shock. To conclude, New York City is very resilient. Resilient. During the pandemic, we passed the fiscal stress of a lifetime with flying colors. That is, we did not engage in short-term borrowing to fund our operations. We met all our financial obligations, including pension contributions and debt obligations. We did not lay off a single employee. And more importantly, we did not have to do major service reductions. However, our financial resilience is not an accident or a mere good fortune. It is the product of careful planning, recognizing that the value of hedging against future uncertainty and using resources wisely. And understanding that even though the recovery is progressing, we face significant headwinds and are not out of the woods just yet. By rigorously following a fiscally responsible plan, this administration excelled in its first budget cycle. We have taken great steps to make the cities a better place to live, work, visit, and raise a family. We have elevated vulnerable New Yorkers and set aside an unprecedented level, level of resources to get us uh, through enforcing future down cycles. We did all of this while working collaboratively with the city council and reaching one of the earliest budget agreements in nearly 30 years. As the mayor likes to say, we got stuff done. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you so much for that and for that complete rundown, uh, uh, the discussion of all the things that have been accomplished so far. We appreciate that and thank you for the, so much. We are collecting questions and comments from our audience and Brian Kasuba, our associate director of the center is collecting them and we will, uh, and we encourage you to, to uh, ask more questions. Uh, this is an opportunity that's rare to have an opportunity to directly question the OMB director. So we do ask uh, and hope that the audience will ask good questions. We'd like to uh, thank also the people who put together this program, particularly uh, Brian Casuba, Lillian Baye-Cantiago, the staff of the center and the law school for the terrific work in putting together these breakfasts. Um, so um, I have a few questions myself, but first let's go to Brian Casuba and the first question from the audience, Brian. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so we have several good questions. Please remember to uh, state your name and affiliation. Our first question is coming from Christopher Kapianiak, who's a uh, second year law student at New York Law School and an intern for the Center for City Law this summer. What are some changes brought on by COVID-19 pandemic and the recent Omicron surge that will become a permanent part of life in New York City going forward? One in particular, is uh, the um, new form of uh, working, which is uh, the uh, model that was discussed, uh, the hybrid people working from home and come to the office you know, once or twice a week. This uh, will have uh, significant ramifications for uh, the city's economy and because many of the city's businesses rely on foot traffic. 
And uh, so if you have fewer people coming to the city, uh, most likely, you know, uh, business uh, in the uh, business districts in New York City will suffer. But more importantly, uh, the commercial real estate market in New York City uh, will also suffer. Uh, New York is very resilient. We will find a different model uh, in terms of our best to use uh, uh, the space in New York City, commercial space in New York City. But in the short term, that's going to create some uh, um, some challenges that uh, we have uh, to overcome. I could, I, this is, from my perspective, uh, what I think would be uh, the most fundamental change. Now, the question is whether this trend will survive a recession, okay? That we don't know. In other words, once the balance of power shift, because right now workers have the upper hand in terms of, because this is a very, a uh, 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 labor market that is very tight. So when you have a shift in the power from, you know, if you have a recession where everybody wants to be on the good side of the boss, you know, and the boss is looking at you like, okay, I'm only going to keep people who come to the office. So we don't know, okay? We don't know what the dynamics is going to be going forward, but I'm assuming there will also be some uh, changes. Um, a, you know, if we were to, if, you know, if uh, we were to uh, enter a recession. Great. Our next question is from Philip uh, Tunnetrack from ET Partners LLC. Um, how much has been spent to date on the project to build four jails to replace Rikers? Uh, what's the current estimate of the total cost? Um, and what is your view on the impact? That the budget will face during the period during this period to, to for these facilities to be financed. Um, currently, we have in a capital plan about eight uh, some eight billion dollars over eight billion dollars and uh, for these uh, four jails. And um, as far as I know, we are still on track. I think it's for the year twenty twenty six, I believe. Um, so there's not there's not been any change in our plan uh, for these uh, projects. Our next question is from Malka Amar, uh, 3L at NYLS and uh, a Center for City Law intern. Um, did you confront any issues when determining the, uh, the budget to allocate for Mayor Adams' plan regarding housing and homelessness? Do you think the current budget will suffice to achieve Mayor Adams' plan? Um, we added, we, I mean, as uh, you probably know, we are dealing with uh, some uh, constraints in terms of our, our ability to borrow money because uh, our ability to borrow is basically by state constitution is limited by uh, the value of uh, properties in New York City. It's about 10% of our average over five years. Because value of properties, particular commercial values of property have declined over time, our capacity to borrow decline. So, because the capacity to borrow decline, so even if the mayor has the mayor had a very ambitious uh, uh, objective in terms of his housing plan, but that that ambition that uh, his his uh, ambition was limited by ability to borrow. So, therefore, we had to curtail, okay, and added about five billion dollars to the capital plan because his pledge was to add four billion dollars a year. We couldn't do $4 billion a year in light of the constraints that we had uh, with respect to our capacity to borrow money. So therefore, we added $5 billion. But the $5 billion that we add would make it about, uh, would bring the total investment we're making over a 10-year period of about $22 billion. Uh, is $22 billion enough? Uh, I doubt it because we have a lot of needs in New York City. We have very supply constraints. So therefore, we probably need a lot more. But again, we are challenged because of our capacity to borrow. Great. Our next question is from Jeff uh, Malamy. Uh, the Adams administration has a, has a strong equity focus from where city resources are spent to hiring workforce that reflects and New York City's diversity. Hiring managers are, are valuing lived experience, not just recruiting from top universities. But what are agencies limited to um, hiring a, a new hire rates within each civil service range title? Uh, for titles that foster a diverse workforce, the new hire rates are 40 to 50K, which is no longer a living wage for families in New York City. 
Yeah, it, it, it's a challenge that, uh, as I said, this is a very tight labor market that we're dealing with. It's very hard for the city to compete with private sector because private sector employers are paying a lot more than uh, what we can pay. But however, uh, there is a, a lot of good uh, working for the public sector. That is, uh, we're providing service to the public. Okay, you cannot put a price on that. Uh, so, as I said to folks, we cannot compete with uh, private employers in terms of trying to match uh, the rate that we pay. But what we offer that the private employers don't offer is a, the, the feeling, the gratitude that you get from providing services, public service to the public. When you know the garbage has been picked up and you see them being picked up, when you're saying you have a safe street, a clean street, uh, there is some gratification that comes from knowing you are part of this big uh, machine trying to get the city moving. Okay. Our next question is from Lauren uh, Meldia. Meldia. Uh, what studies show that poverty, while, while studies show that poverty is a great contributor to crime, they do not show that increased public safety measures contribute to economic growth. Can you explain what the theory of the mayor's office is with increasing public safety safety spending as a recovery strategy? Uh, we, as I said to you, uh, the mayor made it clear, um, uh, public safety is a prerequisite to, um, uh, to, um, to economic recovery because as any, anyone uh, would, good sense would tell you, there is no uh, reason why a business should uh, basically spend in an area where he, the business feel like uh, uh, their employees uh, are not safe. I mean, when they have options, they have other places they could go. So therefore, uh, 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 creating an environment where the public feels safe, where people could take, get on the subway without worrying about crime, when you don't have walking down the street, you don't have to worry about crime, Okay, it's always a catalyst to attract businesses in that area. I mean, it is uh, uh, the notion that uh, if you don't pay attention to crime and you know, thinking that business is gonna expand an area where you have a high crime rate, it's uh, to me, it's nonsensical. So uh, it's, uh, are we saying this is the only uh, solution? No, we're not saying this at all. The mayor made it clear. We have to create a safe environment at the same time. He also said we have to make Invest in, investment in upstream solutions. That is, before people get into crime, create an environment for kids to go, which is why we're spending so much money on summer youth employment. We have our, all kind of program for summer rising so that we don't have our, our kids in the street, warming the street without any objects, any goals in mind. We're trying to create an environment for the kids, okay, to basically uh, uh, be safe, Okay, do their things, do their learning, okay, play with uh, uh, other kids, do what they need to, they, to do in a very clean and safe environment. So we're not just talking about public safety as the only solution. We're saying public safety is very important, okay, to attract business in, 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 in an area. But we also think, we also believe that we must also make optimum investment so that we don't lose out a lot of the young kids that we have to gangs and to other uh, violent uh, activities. Great. Our next question is coming in from Cassidy Strong and uh, New York Law School 2L, also an intern with us this summer. Um, how do you think office vacancies and the rise of hybrid work environments will affect the city's economy long term? Um, as I indicated, uh, um, New York used to be a manufacturing economy and uh, and as we start losing manufacturing industries in New York City uh, we shifted our focus to other uh, we to other sectors of the of the economy okay so same thing from my perspective I see here you know I, I could see because you know, I have, we have some very shrewd very smart investors particularly folks in the real sector and if they see that the train is not coming back in terms of people returning back to the office, my expectation is they will adjust as well. Okay. 
and uh, there are other there are other things that could be you know the the, the, the empty space uh, can be used for whether you, they could be converted long term into housing they could you know so a lot of conversion could take place you wouldn't probably need some zoning changes you probably need some policy changes but uh, I believe that uh, long term we will find a solution to deal with uh, the issue if it persists if we have a long term problem in terms of uh, uh, office, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, occupancy is uh, is basically is uh, remains uh, very, you know, uh, remains very low. Great. Our next question is coming in from Andre P. Uh, the city spends about fifty-eight thousand dollars per homeless person per year, close to five thousand per month, and doesn't have much to show for it. Wouldn't it be better for them? as well as taxpayers to just give them the money directly, the same landlords who illegally turn down um, city FHEPS vouchers will gladly take the cash. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, these things are not mutually exclusive because by law, the, the city has to provide shelter to anyone that is homeless on a daily basis. So in other words, this is a fair point, a fair criticism, but at the same time, you must understand that anyone at any given night in new york city must be given shelter if they seek shelter so therefore we could never get rid of the notion of paying for shelter on a daily basis because that's part of uh, the makeup of new york city uh, because by law we have to but long term uh, that's a that, that's a direction we're moving we're moving into supportive housing uh where we provide uh, uh, you know, all kind of services uh long term uh, for um, folks who have been in the shelter system uh, and really understand the criticism and that, that's the reason why the past uh, two or three years that's the direction the city has been moving. Can't hear you. Next Maybe. question is from Glenn Newman from Greenberg Traurig. Um, what is your view on whether property tax reform will be pursued in, in Mayor Adams's first term? Um, First term, on, um, I think we are very committed uh, to pursue uh, property tax reform. I uh, spent a lot of years myself uh, just trying to make sense of uh, the system and uh, work with the last commission to come up uh, with solutions to address uh, some of the inequities that we have uh, in the system. So we reviewing, we're spending time reviewing the recommendations of the last uh, of, the, of, the, of the last commission, uh, uh, so that we could uh, make sense in terms of particularly uh, in futures uh, uh, legislative session in Albany. Because no matter what we do here in New York, we have to go to Albany, okay, to get authority to uh, reform uh, the uh, property tax system. So we're putting things together, but in the meantime. Uh, knowing how uh, difficult things are for many of the property owners in New York City, the mayor and the council basically just, uh, as part of the adopted budget, um, is committed to, uh, are committed to basically do the property tax rebate to provide short term relief uh, to property owners. But we are fully committed to review and make recommendations to the mayor uh, so that we could have a package ready for future sessions in Albany to take it to the legislature to see you know, what can be done. Okay, our next question is coming in from Ryan Prasad. Um, I am, uh, Ryan is, is, is starting New York Law School as a first year this fall. And um, his, his mom is borough manager for the New York City Department of Finance. Um, his question is, what advice do you have for current and future law students that want to pursue a career in city government? um it's a great question um i um i always advise uh, uh young folks to uh, uh, expand your horizon uh, and uh, look at the opportunities in the public sector because the uh, public sector is uh, the work is very rewarding um and uh, my uh, object my first thing would be to tell them you know what go to uh, dcas website uh, which is uh, the citywide administrative administration uh, website, basically look for opportunities or look on the different agencies where you have interests 
And uh, if you have interest in, uh, in finance, you could go to the website of the Department of Finance or come to the website of OMB, look for opportunities and apply for them. Um, because uh, these are very rewarding jobs and you're making a difference in uh, everyday lives of New Yorkers. Great. Um, do um, a couple more questions and then turn it over to Dean Kral and, and Professor Sandler. Um, next question is coming in from Robert and Bill uh, Hubbard. Um, did you say that the city had committed to 22 billion for housing? Can you clarify the timing of the city's commitment and the allocation between capital and annual expenses? This is a, a 10 year capital, over a 10 year period, we committed $22 billion in capital for housing between NYCHA and uh, HPD. Um, and our final question before we turn it over is uh, uh, Marty, Jack, the city lost a great number of residents and business establishments causing loss of revenue. What is the plan to reverse this trend? Well, again, the plan is to basically uh, try to continue to attract, uh, make New York City a very uh, uh, att attractive place so that people can live with a family, do your business in New York City. That is the goal. The goal is to provide a safe and environment uh, for New York City businesses to prosper, which is the objective of the mayor and to make New York City tax competitive. And uh, we've been doing a lot of things, as you can imagine, in terms of reducing fees at the mayor as a, a, an executive order, basically, to make sure that we reduce fees, try to be get out of the way of businesses uh, for them to develop and expand in New York City. So we're creating a very friendly business environment mm -hmm. to make sure that business are attracted to New York City and come here to invest and make New York City their home. Thank you, Director. And uh, we'll share all the questions that we didn't get to with the director for follow up. Uh, and his staff. Um, and now I turn our uh, attention to Dean Anthony Crowell and Professor Ross Sandler. Okay, let me uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we always enjoy the Q&A part of this uh, program. Uh, we welcome Dean Anthony Crowell to the colloquy. I would uh, ask uh, uh, the, just one, one, two comments. Um, uh, I um, All of us have our favorite part of the budget. I have two favorite parts. One is after school programs, which I hope expand. And the other is preventive maintenance on bridges. Could you speak to both of those? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, after school, as you know, we uh, expanded uh, summer youth employment program. We have, like this is the first time we moved from uh, 70,000 slots a year to about 100,000 slots a year. Same thing with summarizing. Uh, the goal, and the mayor is very clear on this, the mayor wants to have uh, um, all year, not just summarizing, but all year round uh, kind of after school program. But summarizing is, uh, is, uh, is has expanded significantly by over 10,000 slots this year to about 210. So the focus is on after school program and program that basically that uh, provide a safe environment uh, for our children to go and learn, particularly after the pandemic, because they have a lot, okay, to make up. You know, we have they have to make up for a lot in those uh, because of the past uh, uh, two years of the pandemic. Uh, regarding uh, maintenance, we continue to uh, make sure that uh, uh, our bridges are very safe. Uh, we have a program that we work with DOT uh, to basically prioritize. Okay, and look at uh, the safety of the different bridges. And uh, we continue to invest and to make sure that they maintain properly. And then uh, whatever is needed to make sure that uh, our wooden bridges are safe. Dean Crow, you would like to join the conversation? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Director Jia. Yeah, we appreciate it tremendously. And uh, I know that you have had a particularly challenging few months, um, not only with the transition to a new mayor, which always presents new and sometimes fun, uh, but always unexpected challenges, but also the city has a lot of a lot of headwinds that it's confronting. I'd love to dig in a little bit about projected revenues um, in, in the next year or so. Um, my first question is, 
what do you see as um, some of the challenges, if any, related to the increasing prevalence of remote work with fewer uh, with fewer employees coming into the central business districts of the city? And, uh, and what will that impact be on, on tax revenue? Yeah, this is a very, very, very good question uh, because this is something that we struggle with uh throughout uh, uh the budget process uh, as uh, we do uh tax revenue forecast uh from our perspective um we uh looking at um, the commercial uh reset market vacancy to peak in 2023 okay so currently we have a record high of 20 percent Okay, we expect it to probably pick somewhere 21, 22%, somewhere in 2023. And uh, and we keep it flat in the outages. We don't see major. So therefore our property taxes, because our property tax system relies so much on commercial real estate. Okay. So therefore our property tax in the outages of the financial plan, if you look at it more or less stable, you mean flat. What we have growing, okay, because we're not assuming a recession at this point in time, okay, is the non-property tax. In, in other words, the income-sensitive taxes, personal income taxes, sales taxes, we expect them to continue to grow over time, particularly sales tax because of inflation. As price of everything increases, naturally, you know, assuming consumption remains a constant, you know, the revenue, you know, the sales continue to grow, our sales tax will increase because we're taxing on a higher sales tax base. Okay. The tax base, you know, the tax base will be higher because of inflation. So therefore we're expecting that to continue to increase. What we're concerned about right now is the capital gains because of uh, the instability that we're seeing on Wall Street. You know, that will, even though we expect wages to increase, higher wage should translate into a higher personal income tax. But because we rely so much in New York City on capital gains, okay, the fact that we're having a bear market right now is a major concern for us. How long is going to be, is going to last, we don't know. I'm hoping it could be very short lived. But if it lasts a very long period of time for a year or two, you have this kind of instability in the stock market, that would also have a negative impact on our personal income taxes. So right now it's a mixed bag on the income side, income sensitive taxes. You know, some will go up, some will go down, or more or less. But in terms of uh, the uh, impact of uh, on the commercial uh, real estate of uh, working from home, we expect that uh, to have more or less, you uh, know, I mean, we drop at the beginning of, of, of the, of, of the um, property tax drop at the beginning of uh, the pandemic. Rebounded sometimes this year, but we keep it flat in the arches of the financial plan. Great. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you give us some insights into the city's um, uh, bond rating and some of the concerns? New York City has historically had uh, extremely strong ratings what what do the, the the confluence of issues right now that we're facing um what kind of what kind of potential threats might it pose to our bond rating and what what is being done to make sure that we uh maintain um actually after the, uh, we issued the executive budget uh, uh first time in 10 years fitch rating upgraded outlook right okay? uh, uh from stable to positive which is the first step our goal is to go back to the rating agencies actually to look for an upgrade um, because we believe uh, the budget we just adopted is so strong in terms of the reserves that we have. I mean, we have $8.3 billion in reserves. This is the highest ever. So you can imagine we move from uh, the highest peak of our budget reserve was $6 billion. Okay. And we had that $6 billion at the top of the business cycle. In other words, back before the pandemic we had six billion dollars in reserve now that we are recovering okay from the pandemic we're not even close we're talking about 77 percent of jobs recovered okay all right we're not at 100 percent of the job we're already at 8.3 billion dollars in other words 
we build up our reserve even though higher than where we used to be at the top of the business cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from our perspective, we are in such a strong position, okay, that the rating agency should take that into account. Okay, particularly in light of the fact that we just passed the major stress test, the biggest stress test the city has ever had, closing an economy for about a year, okay? And without, so we did this without major, major budget crisis in New York City. And that was before we received any federal aid. People felt, don't, rem people, uh, don't, uh, don't remember all the steps that we took before we received federal aid, okay? We spent about like eight months, okay? And we balance our books every single budget, okay? In the three budgets prior to receiving federal aid, we balance all three without resorting to short-term borrowing, without, um, uh, uh, we met all our obligations, you know, whether it's bond obligations, pension obligations, we didn't have to lay off a single employee because what we did is instead of laying off employees, we put in place a very strict attrition policy it was a three for one. So you could only hire, you could only, you could hire one employee for every three that you lost. So therefore, without resorting to layoff, okay, we reduced headcount from 327,000 to about 304,000. Okay. So we did all of these things, okay, all right, before we even receive any federal aid. So from our perspective, we uh, 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 went through a major crisis. And we passed that uh, uh, stress test with flying colors. And coming out of the pandemic, we are putting the city in a very, very, very strong position. We have a very conservative tax forecast. We have manageable out gaps. And we have a very, very, very high level of reserves. So we feel very strong. And our goal is to go back to the rating agency and ask for a rating increase. Great. Um, can you give us a little bit of, of long-term insight on the city's infrastructure investment plan? I know that um, there's obviously uh, a tremendous need citywide. Um, what, what are the strategies that you'll use to get as much federal aid um, and, and assistance from the state as well in terms of building up an infrastructure program in addition to um, in addition to debt programs? Yeah. Um, as I indicated earlier, our debt program is limited by our borrowing capacity right. because of the drop in value of properties. Uh, so therefore, uh, what we're doing as a strategy, because, and at the same time, we have a lot of infrastructure needs, particularly in the area of resiliency work. Okay. Uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, with the flood, you know, we have all kind of uh, infrastructure needs in the city and housing needs. We have a bunch of needs. So therefore, our strategy is basically to uh, tap into uh, federal grants, infrastructure federal grants, as much as possible, try to be as smart as we can be and as aggressive as we can be in terms of applying for the different uh, uh, grants. Uh, that we have uh, at uh, the federal level uh, based on the uh, uh, infrastructure investment uh, law, infrastructure, infrastructure uh, investment uh, that uh, the federal government uh, program that the federal government uh, uh, issued about a year ago. So our court is working with the different agencies to try to maximize as much as we can, okay, those grants to bring money home. And at the same time, uh, try to be, to use as smartly as possible the remaining the capacity that we have okay so we're prioritizing housing we're prioritizing a lot of things that from our perspective critical okay so that we could uh, address the uh, uh, housing challenges that uh, we're dealing with in new york city great and i'll just congratulate you on the night you trust i know that's a big that's, that's a, big a big deal and um it has profound profound opportunity to, yes. to fix uh, the infrastructure needs of the authority, which had been vast and um, and uh, and very very challenging for the past uh, for many many decades. So yes. um, we look forward to that. And and uh, our next speaker will be Greg Russ in uh, yes. in July. If it's a July, nice it will be July fourteenth. Greg Russ will be here, and uh, that will be very important as well. And a good follow-up to your last comments. Yeah, a nice segue into that. 
Yes. Um, we very much appreciate you being here with us. And um, all too often, those in public service are not thanked for what they do, but we thank you for um, all the brain power and energy you bring to your job and the team you have assembled, which is um, quite formidable. OMB has always been uh, a crown jewel for, for, for the city, along with the law department. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I will say, I just, want, I just wanted you to know that we appreciate um, the level of expertise and the hard work that goes into managing the city's budget each year. So thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for a very interesting and informative morning. Uh, and thank you, Dean Crowell, for the good, uh, good questions and good comments. Uh, we really enjoy the colloquy at the end of these breakfasts. Thank you all. The next breakfast will be July 14th with Greg Russ uh, and NYCHA's chair. And uh, that, I hope you all join us there.